you for being with us. This is the uh, first of the academic 2021-22 uh, year, first in our um, Vermont Center on Behavior and Health lecture series. And we're really uh, excited to be kicking it off with Warren Bickle, who as you can see is gonna be talking about his highly innovative um, experimental tobacco marketplace and its contemporary status. <clears throat> Before we turn it over to Warren, I wanna just do a, a brief introduction. Of course, Warren is a, a great friend of mine and, and a wonderful colleague. He's the inaugural behavioral health uh, research endowed professor in the departments of psychiatry and psychology at the Virginia Tech Carol, uh, Carolyn School of Medicine, where he's director of the Addiction Recovery Research Center and co-director of the Center for Transformative Research on Health Behavior. Uh, Warren is a, um, has an outstanding uh, training history. He's a graduate of the University of Vermont's um, very well-known applied behavior, behavior analysis um, PhD program. He did postdoctoral training in behavioral pharmacology at the um, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, program. And then from there on to the Johns Hopkins uh, University School of Medicine's Behavioral Pharmacology Research Unit, which has turned out wonderful um, postdocs and Warren's certainly one of them. Uh, so prior to Virginia Tech, Warren held an endowed professorship at the University of Arkansas from 2004 to 2011. And prior to that position, he spent seven, 17 years as a co-founder and co-director of the University of Vermont Human Behavioral Pharmacology Research Laboratory. So I am very familiar with Warren's uh, work and with his accomplishments and skills. He's an internationally recognized scholar in addictions and uh, especially the behavioral economics and behavioral pharmacology of addictions. He's won numerous national awards for a scholarship, including an NIH merit award. And he's been continuously funded by the NIH throughout his career. So as I said at the outset, we're really um, very lucky and fortunate to have Warren kick off this year's series. So Warren, please take it away. Hey, thanks, Steve. Can everyone hear me first, just to make sure? Yes, um, you're all set, Warren. Great, thank you. So, uh, Steve, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, um, and, and it's great to be presenting at the University of Vermont, a place that was so influential in my early career. And I'm very grateful for those times. And um, the only thing that would make this better if it was in person, so I could say hello to old friends and also make some new friends. But let me move on with my presentation. Yes, I'm gonna talk about the experimental tobacco marketplace. Uh, these are my disclosures. Although I work with these companies, I will not discuss them or any of their products. So the challenge uh, that many of us are aware that work in the tobacco field is that the type and number of tobacco nicotine products has and continues to expand. Um, it makes sense that tobacco control would benefit from estimates of the impact of new policies and products prior to implementation. But how do we accomplish that? Well, um, at Virginia Tech, we decided to take that on. We developed the method to prospectively examine potential policies and forecast the effects on tobacco purchases. Uh, to do so, we're employing our 30 years of experience of using behavioral economics uh, to study tobacco products that began way back at the University of Vermont. So continuity. And you see our very first paper on it listed below with um, good friends and colleagues. Um, so what I'd like to do today is describe the, um, the challenge of tobacco regulatory science, how an experimental method may address that challenge, illustrate the method, and review a curated selection of our research on this topic. So, what is this method? The experimental tobacco marketplace. How do we run it? Well, we take cigarette smokers and we endow them with as much money as they typically spend on tobacco products. Then we put them in front of an Amazon-like interface that we control where we control all the products, their presence or absence, as well as their prices. When we run these sessions, a typical what we do is we have an assessment session 
Um, in some studies, we let them sample the um, any products they're unfamiliar with. Then we uh, move into an ETM session where we'll vary the price or availability of one or more of the products. In a series of choices, they'll make purchases. Um, one of them, those uh, series of choices will come true. They'll walk away with the product, or if they haven't spent all the money, they would walk away with whatever money left over. Um, and then uh, after some time, uh, after the like number of days of tobacco products they purchased, they can come back. If they didn't like the product and want to return it, we'll reimburse them, we'll give them back the, their money. Um, and we'll ask them to rate what they think about the products. We'll also try to understand to the extent they're using any non-laboratory products. And what are our key measures that we get from this? Well, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but I just wonder for those who aren't, um, we look at um, a demand, a demand intensity, demand elasticity illustrated in the top figure. Uh, we look at uh, what is the level of consumption at very low price and the sensitivity of that consumption to price escalations. In a multi-product uh, environment, we're also interested in um, substitution and that's revealed in the lower panel. So as the whatever commodities in the top is being increased in price, the products in the lower panel are staying at a constant price and we're seeing where the allocation of their purchasing goes. Uh, in the two, several hypothetical examples here, uh, we would see like the, this very bottom panel that, sh that shows no effect of the increasing price of the uh, above panel. That's independence between those commodities. And then we have two types of substitution where we see some increases or a lot of increases in purchasing as a function of the price of, of of the above um, commodity. We also can look at demand intensity. I mean, substitution intensity, if there's a big jump at, or a lot of consumption at very low prices. So that's sort of the method and what we're looking for in measures. Uh, why should we have an uh, experimental tobacco marketplace? Well, the, the key observation is that type, the type and number of products in the marketplace alters demand elasticity and substitution profiles. Here's a study that was conducted at the University of Vermont um, with Matt Johnson, where we took cigarette smokers and they were had to become in cigarette deprived for approximately six hours and participate in a numerous number of three hour sessions where they could work on lensing plungers to get access to cigarettes or other products. And they participated in four phases here, one with uh, standard cigarettes, one with um, standard cigarettes increasing in price and actually a fixed ratio response. And uh, gum held at a constant low price. And you can see that gum was a substitute at the highest prices uh, for cigarettes. We also looked at uh, denicotinized cigarettes, at least that's what they were called back then. We would call them now very low nicotine containing cigarettes. And we see a very strong substitution effect as the price of conventional cigarettes increases. Then we put all three products together and increase the price of conventional cigarettes. And what you see is um, shifts in their, in their substitution profiles, particularly for the gum. And although you can't see it quite with this figure, um, the combined figure actually resulted in the least amount of consumption of the uh, nicotine contained, the standard cigarette. Um, but you cannot predict this interaction from just looking at these individual curves. Indeed, um, we can show that with experimental tobacco marketplace with our first studies done with Amanda Cuisenberry um, and Mickey Corfanas, um, Len Epstein and myself and Laura Hatz. Here we're increasing the price of conventional cigarettes in the marketplace and they could choose from all these different products. And in the left-hand panel, as the price of cigarettes goes up, we see um, first a high intensity of substitution with um, a cigarellos and a substitution effect and also um, some substitution effect with um, the um, e-cigarettes and a couple other products. But then if we take the cigarellos out, we get a different substitution profile where gum or with snus rather and e-cigarettes showing the greatest substitution effects. So that's the reason you, uh, to do an experimental tobacco marketplace because 
the number and type of products will, will um, impact and change the substitution profile. Let me just give you a sense of the space that's available with the experimental tobacco marketplace in this next slide. So what we have here is just a little uh, a schematic of how I think about the parameter space. So once again, on the um, over here on the left, we have uh, we can look at demand, we can look at substitution across products, and we can look at substitution across markets. And there I'll be talking about our recent edition of the illegal experimental tobacco marketplace. You can look at the effects of bans or of, of a product or an introduction looking at the bottom. You could look at messages or narratives. You could look at product composition. You could look at constraining features of consumption. For example, a workplace uh, ban on certain products. Um, and you can certainly look at taxes. And with that, you could look at user types. Uh, individuals that are solely um, conventional cigarette smokers, those who are solely electronic cigarette smokers or dual users. And you could also examine a different population such as uh, disadvantaged ones that um, many of you are studied through, through your T cores um, and very interesting work. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is go through um, a series of studies that we've conducted and just illustrate how these effects play out when we manipulate several of these variables. So um, for our second experiment, um, we looked at the effects of nicotine strength on substitution. This is a within subject experimental design with 25 smokers. We looked at different strength of, of e-liquid and, uh, and the substitution uh, profile for, of them when we had um, increased the price of conventional cigarettes. Um, so first, you can see here, we're looking in the panel A on the left-hand side, conventional cigarette demand. We're looking at the amount of nic uh, nicotine purchased through those cigarettes as a function of the cigarette price. And you can see that having different nicotine doses in the e-liquid that's concurrently available has little or no effect on cigarette demand. However, if we look at the substitutability of the e-cigarettes, what we observe is very nice to um, dose dependent effects on intensity and uh, the degree of substitution across these products. The net result is that if, if you had the most highest nicotine content e-liquid with conventional cigarette smokers, ultimately they would end up consuming more nicotine and therefore likely become more dependent. That would be the implication of this observation. So cigarette purchasing decreased as a function of cigarette price in this study. E-liquid purchasing increased as a function of both cigarette price and e-liquid strength. Um, and the 24 milligram e-liquid appeared to function as the best substitute. In our next study, we want to look at the effects of taxes and subsidies. Um, so could these policies help promote substitutability? We looked at taxing conventional cigarettes above the changes in price that we had of either uh, 0, 12.5, 25, and 50%. And we also um, separately examined the subsidizing of e-liquid purchases, uh, either zero subsidization up to 50% subsidization of the cost. So if we look at um, nicotine demand first, uh, in the left-hand panel, we have the, uh, the effect that we would all expect taxes work, right? So um, we get nice tax dependent decreases in elasticity of demand for cigarettes, um, which is very nice. However, subsidy, once again, um, uh, here we see no impact on cigarette demand. So giving people access to cheaper e-liquids doesn't change how much they value or will consume cigarettes in these studies. If we look at um, the impact on the liquid purchases, in the left-hand panel, we're looking at taxes and we see um, some tax dependent increases, right? The slope, um, but we don't really see a lot of evidence of uh, the dose, uh, the subsidization on uh, the, these substitution curves. However, um, 
I mean, this, the, the, the tax condition on the uh, substitution profile. But when we subsidize them, we get nice um, subsidy dependent effects on the amount of nicotine purchased. Interestingly enough, right, when we're manipulating taxes um, on top of the cigarette price, we could combine the, those costs and examine a concept I love a lot from behavioral economics, unit price. And when we take um, the left-hand panels from the demand and from the substitution profile and turn them into unit price for cigarettes, they, they um, produce a smooth curve of demand and substitution, uh, which ultimately suggests the power of you know, the unit price as a determinant of consumption. So to summarize these results, cigarette price decreased cigarette and increased e-liquid purchasing. Cigarette ta taxes decreased cigarette purchasing and marginally increased e-liquid purchasing. And e-liquid subsidy had no effect on cigarette purchasing and increased uh, e-liquid purchasing at the 50% subsidy. Now, the next study is uh, one that we just recently published and we're interested in following up in additional studies. And that's looking at integrated tax policies. I probably don't have to tell people here that across the United States, um, how tobacco and nicotine products are priced is completely wacky. Um, some states tax e-cigarettes, uh, e some don't at all. The, national, the federal government doesn't tax uh, e-liquids, at least the last time I looked. Um, and there's all kinds of disparity across um, different states and communities of how they're taxed. Several um, groups have suggested that because these taxes are heterogeneous, we are missing an opportunity to try to improve health. And at least two um, approaches have been suggested, one by the World Health Organization and Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, which is a tobacco parity tax. All tobacco slash you know, nicotine, um, except for medicinal, um, should be taxed equally and, and vigorously. Alternatively, Chalupka and, and Warner in a, in a paper suggested these taxes should be harm related. That is the most harmful to tobacco product should be in fact taxed the most and help drive people to lower harm products. Well, we wanted to test uh, these outcomes in the experimental tobacco marketplace, something that you could do um, and learn something about their effects prior to implementation of such a policy. First, um, across all the products purchased and, and the conditions examined, and when I say trials here, we're looking at different uh, price structures um, for whatever the targeted products are. Uh, but the total uh, nicotine consumed is relatively not different between harm reduction and tobacco parity taxes structures um, across a broad range of prices. So nicotine is a driver, right? Um, and price is a driver, uh, but their distribution in the purchasing of those products uh, of, of that nicotine varies by the nature of the products available in their tax structure. Let's take a look. So um, of course, these different tax structures require that different arrays of products be taxed in different ways, right? So for tax tobacco parity, everything that has um, nicotine in it um, is taxed, right? Uh, except for um, therapeutic nicotine. Um, so we had developed three tax tiers. Highest tax uh, would, would be this, uh, the, the red. Um, we wanted to have some sort of intermediate level. So we we took that looked at um, you know essentially lettuce cigarettes, um, which don't have nicotine and probably have a fewer um, you know doesn't a tobacco related product, and then we had the gum. And as we increase the price of the highest tier um, tobacco products, we see little or no purchasing of of the zero nicotine containing products, which include also. Uh, zero nicotine e e liquid. And at the later prices, we saw an increase in gum and lozenge substitution. 
in the harm reduction um, structure where once again, um, anything that was burning was considered to be the most harmful, followed by um, those that may not have to make you consume burning product and may therefore produce less of the trosamines, not necessarily, but was probably less um, of the agents that would be caused cancer among other things. And then um, once when we had gum and lozenge at the lowest test here. And what we saw is we increased the price of the um, high and medium taxes concurrently, we see a shift to the intermediate products here. And then um, a once again, a slight increase in the uh, therapeutic nicotine, showing the difference in outcomes between these two products. Now, if the goal is to reduce consumption of the harmful product with this increase that you see here in the, in the mid-tier group, um, that probably is a reduction in some harm. Now, of course, this harm reduction policy would have to be updated over time as new information became available about the different uh, harms related to these products. Um, but it shows um, the differential effects and it's useful to know those effects before deciding on a policy. Um, so tobacco parity, decreased purchasing of all tobacco products increased purchasing of medicinal uh, nicotine, harm reduction, decreased purchasing of combustible products, result in greater purchase of ends and smokeless tobacco. And total nicotine purchase was not significantly different between proposals, but higher taxes uh, yielded lower demand. Now we'd like to shift the gears and talk about other ways that we can influence um, responding in the experimental tobacco marketplace. And that is the use of narratives or messaging. Here's a three-dimensional um, space of how we think about um, narratives. Uh, so uh, these narratives can refer to the past, the present, or the future. They can be, uh, I can create a narrative for myself. That would be like episodic future thinking if it was about the future. Um, I could create a story for somebody else, and that would be, um, having them read a story about something that may happen to them. Or um, they could read stories that um, like I made about people they may know or may not know and see how that influences their behavior. And we can look at um, the outcomes of those stories either being positive or negative in balance, right? So we did that with the experimental tobacco marketplace. We looked at a variety of, of narratives. Um, here's one. Jesse, your best friend, smokes about as many cigarettes as you do in a day. She called to tell you that she had not been feeling very well. Jesse tells you she went to the doctor. The doctor drew blood for some tests. She received her results and it was only the flu and that she's feeling much better. She's extremely happy, right? That's a positive narrative. Here's a negative narrative. She tells you she received her results. She has a high level of toxins in her blood as a result of cigarette smoking. Jesse now has to undergo expensive treatment and may face a lower life expectancy and have a greater likelihood of having high blood pressure, heart attacks, or, blo or, or, or blood cancers. Um, these narratives were based on um, uh, ads that were developed by the by NCI. So we, we took them and sort of just modified them. Then we had a um, story that was negative um, and Jesse expresses extreme regret for ever smoking. And then we had a story where um, negative results happened. Um, and then Jesse, however, produces behavior change and that improves her outcomes. So that those are sort of the, the range of stories that we had. So, you know, we measured some baseline. Uh, they're exposed to narratives, positive, negative, negative with regret or negative with change. And then we put them in the ETM and we ex examined how they purchased. And here are their results from the study. Um, so we're looking at, we're increasing the price of conventional cigarettes and that's the top curve that you see in all these. And then we're looking at the substitution profiles that result in the positive, negative, negative with regret and negative with change. And you can see negative um, with regret produces a little more effect than negative alone. Um, negative with change, however, produces sh um, switching points where um, 
the e-cigarette uh, is purchased more than conventional cigarettes in this study. So uh, one of the things that can be done with the ETM is look at messaging and other narratives as a way to influence purchasing, a way to empirically test um, health messaging, which I think is interesting. So in this study, narratives describing negative outcomes with regret or change were more effective in producing substitution. Narratives can be used to alter the relative preference of conventional cigarettes um, and e-cigarettes. Now, there's been a lot of discussion uh, recently with my Food and Drug Administration about the status of uh, e-cigarettes. Um, you saw with the, some of the actions they've been taking. Uh, they've also been concerned about um, flavors and have been working to um, and different communities also have put uh, limitations on flavors. And one thing that um, is a concern is will people begin to start looking for illegal sources of products? So we decided to expand our experimental tobacco marketplace and have an option where people can go to quote unquote to the dark web and par purchase illegal products. So, um, and already illicit trade in tobacco products is ongoing. It's often available via internet purchase. Um, some of these products may contain adulterants not found in commercial products that could be unhealthy. Uh, the efficacy of mitigation strategies to suppress illegal purchasing is unknown. And we don't really have any um, reasonable empirical models that we could apply a priori. So that's what we wanted to, to explore. So we took, uh, this was a, a, an online study, this first one, uh, we looked at the effects of reduced nicotine standard on legal purchasing. We told people that the Food and Drug Administration had um, elected an option where nicotine would be dramatically reduced in all conventional cigarettes that would produce less satisfaction um, when they smoked them. And then we examined um, how they would prefer either the legal marketplace or the legal or the illegal marketplace across five price trials. And here we're looking at the probability of purchasing from the illegal marketplace when we're just having conventional cigarettes increasing in price and we see some um, price dependent increases in exploring the uh, illicit market, looking for a cheaper option. Um, when we introduce the concept of the very low nicotine tanning cigarette, what we see is a uh, upward shift uh, and leftward shift of the curve um, where people are more, the participants were more likely at each price to uh, check out the illegal market. So price and product standards can alter substitutability between legal and illegal marketplaces and their products. That was like our first foray in that, and that paper still is in production. We'll get that submitted shortly. Um, but then we jumped in and we said, okay, what about vaping bans on illegal purchases? Um, which seemed very prescient um, given some of the things that are happening uh, throughout the, the country at different state levels and city levels. So once again, this was online. We looked at e-cigarette users Conventional cigarette smokers alone, e-cigarette users, um, sole e-cigarette users, and dual users. And um, we looked at the effects of a ban on e-cigarettes, uh, a, a ban on flavors. And we also examined to what extent monetary fines would influence the likelihood of purchasing from the, from the illegal market. We wanted to look at some of the mitigation strategies. This is a complex figure, let me explain it. So at the top, we've got cigarettes, sole cigarette smokers, dual users, and e-cigarette users across the top. Um, we're looking at the predicted, uh, 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 on the y-axis, predicted probability of choosing the illegal marketplace. And then we have um, the price of, for a legal cigarette increasing in each of those three panels. And then we have our three conditions, the vaping ban, the flavored vaping ban, and no ban. Um, and what we see is um, the, the rank order of these three um, conditions were, were the, in the same order across the three groups. 
but the magnitude differed very, very, uh, very much. Cigarette smokers showed some price dependent increases uh, under these different conditions of looking at the illicit market. Dual cigarette users showed a much more, more robust effect where the vaping ban itself produced the greatest amount of uh, exploration of legal market, but that was cigarette price dependent. Among e-cigarette users, they're, they're not worried about the price of, of conventional cigarettes. So in the banned conditions, they just jumped up right to the top um, and have a perfect, oh, nearly uh, unity for the uh, vaping ban itself. Um, so we looked at the likelihood of purchasing um, in the legal market as a function of fines. From that, we constructed a demand curves um, for uh, fine dependent de changes in, in purchasing from the illicit market. And you can see that e-cigarette smokers um, were least ban sensitive compared to dual users and um, conventional cigarette users. And that effect, uh, we had a significant effect of elasticity of demand, the slope of these curves uh, between e-cigarette users and the other two using groups. Uh, it gives you a sense, right? So if you want to get a 50% reduction in purchasing of, of illicit products, you'd be like, you know, like around uh, maybe 200 bucks for um, cigarette smokers, closer to 300 for dual users, and, you know, something like 800 for um, e-cigarette only users. So the effects of uh, vaping bans on legal purchases, bans increased illegal purchases, exclusive e-cigarette smokers um, had the largest effect. Increasing cigarette price also increased illegal purchasing. Exclusive cigarette smoke, for, particularly for uh, exclusive cigarette smokers and dual users. Um, the vaping ban produced greater uh, illicit purchases, purchases than the flavor ban. And monetary fines suppressed illegal purchasing. Um, Exclusive e-cigarette users being the most resistant. So then we wanted, to, we had an opportunity because we're involved with the International Tobacco Consortium, Tobacco Control Consortium, to explore this same set of conditions. We also added one other condition, uh, and people are participating in their yearly sur, their every other year survey. So we had 452 smokers, e-cigarette users, and dual users. We had a no, no ban, vaping ban, total flavor vaping ban, and a partial flavor vaping ban, permitting only um, menthol and mint. And once again, we looked at marketplace um, preference. Now here's an even more complex figure. Set up just like the other one. We got cigarettes, dual users, and e-cigarette users at the, at the top of these three panels, because these individuals are from either England, the United States, or Canada. Um, and we're looking at a no ban, partial flavor ban, total flavor ban, and e-cigarettes. So the general rank order of these different conditions in generating illegal marketplace behavior is comparable across the different um, countries, though there are still country-specific differences. Um, in England, the, the purchasing of illicit market uh, for dual users is significantly lower than, uh, than the U.S. and certainly less so than in Canada, which is very interesting. Uh, um, greater comparability for the e-cigarette users across those conditions. So this shows that um, this work can be done. We can look at generalities and differences across different countries as policies are being implemented. Um, so I'm gonna you know, sort of summarize where we are, right? So the, in the experimental tobacco marketplace, what I showed you is um, the impact of nicotine doses, taxes and subsidies, integrated tax policies, narratives and messaging, very low nicotine uh, cigarette standard on illegal purchasing, flavor bans on illegal purchasing, e-cigarette bans on illegal purchasing, and international comparisons of these bans. Um, the reason I wanna just quickly review that because I, I wanna impress upon you that the experimental tobacco marketplace is a robust and highly um, flexible methodology for the study of the interactions of diverse tobacco products. 
And I, I have to thank my team. Uh, this is an old photograph. I need to get an updated one, but we haven't been all in the same place for a long time to get such a picture. So I want to uh, thank them, and particularly Roberta Limos, who's been key in um, a lot of these ETM studies. And I'd be pleased to have a discussion and talk with people about their questions or suggestions that they have for the ETM. Great, Warren. Thanks for a really uh, stimulating, wonderful presentation. Um, you, you will not soon lose your reputation for being one of the most creative investigators that I know of in the area of uh, substance use. So um, there are a couple questions in the Q&A um, area here. I'll, I'll read one. Um, the first, thank you very much for your presentation. In the ETM that manipulates cigarette taxes and e-cigarette subsidies, were there changes made, were, were the changes made salient to participants? Um, yes, right. So um, we, we have a big descriptor at, at the beginning of each of the ETM purchasing um, conditions. And it was also, I uh, believe, reflected in the, um, when they would check out, right? So we go through like the whole Amazon, like if you go purchase something on Amazon, right? You put it in your cart and then you have to check out, right? And um, we have that same process and they could see the, the subsidy or the taxes being implemented at that, at that time, right? And once again, they, even for the online studies, but also for the in-person in -person studies, right? They're walking with, gonna get real products and take away the leftover money. Online, uh, we still calculate a budget for them based on how much they normally smoke. Um, and they their purchases have to be constrained by that budget. Um, so the taxes and subsidies uh, reflected that, um, you know, had to be reflected in those um, and be within their budget. Okay, Warren, so we have another. In the illegal uh, ETM, how difficult is it for participants to access the illegal marketplace? Yeah, it's it's not too hard, right? It's pushing a, a button. You go to the other, the dark web. Um, probably not dissimilar than purchasing um, online, potentially illegal products, but it's very different than if you had to go to the corner, right? Um, and one could easily um, start thinking about further exploration of, of this type of thing where there would be a delay, right? So you know, let's just think about the, what things could be manipulated in an illicit marketplace. So um, there's a chance that you might not get the, what you wanted, right? You buy something illegal, um, it could be, um, they're gonna send you a lettuce leaf cigarette, who knows? Um, one, two, the product may be stepped on in some fashion, right? Or, you know, broken or not fully uh, integrated. You know, like you buy a fresh pack who might be um, damaged to some extent. Um, there probably could be delays to its receipt um, as well as the potential of penalties. We, ex um, we have a, a paper which I have, um, we're just about ready to submit. Or I think we just submitted actually, um, where we wanted to find out whether the penalties that we were imposing, you know, which are hypothetical, still had some impact on people. And we looked at a range of them. We looked at fines. We looked at being um, having yourself be identified as a legal purchaser uh, with your the police department, your name and, and address being put on a website by the police, uh, and a couple other factors. And we wanted to see whether it affect the profile of mood scale, right? Would it make, would the um, contemplating do that alter um, how people Mood, and we found that um, being identified to the police was actually most concerning, um, if I remember correctly, and um, and it, it produced negative mood states. Um, so you, so there's ways to explore whether even in some simulated fashion, uh, some of these factors may produce effects consistent with what you might expect would be the case in the real world. Great. I want to encourage those in the audience to continue. We have, Warren left us plenty of time for Q&A, so uh, please don't hesitate to send additional questions. Um, there's a third here. What type of questions is it important for participants to have sampled or experienced with all products that are available? Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, the, the, 
uh, this is another good dimension of the model, right? So are you interested in people uh, seeing whether conditions will get them to try a product? Well, then you don't want to give them exposure, right? Then you're examining whether whatever conditions you're imposing will get people to sample the product um, in the purchasing it's of itself. However, if you're interested in whether these things might be a substitute over a longer term, identifying that people already have a history of experience um, makes that more likely to be the case, right? So they're not trying it, they've already tried it. So it really comes down to the experimental question uh, of interest. Uh, are you interested in whether people are gonna pick up something and give it a try or whether something's gonna perhaps function as a longer duration substitute? Um, I think, I think um, that's interesting. I th one of the other things I'm very interested in exploring in this uh, model is if we look at, you know, this has been done some with, somewhat, I think, already with the purchase task, but I wonder whether um, the likelihood of switching away from conventional cigarettes would be an indicator of the, the relative value of cigarettes and could be a predictor of treatment outcomes, right? If you're um, much more elastic, your nicotine consumption, would that be demonstration of um, greater susceptibility to treatment related effects? I don't know, that'd be interesting to find out. Well, here's, here's another um, from Caitlin Browning, who is postdoctoral fellow with us. All the others have been anonymous, um, but I, is also um, starting to research the um, experimental tobacco marketplace. So uh -huh. yes, can you, can you speak to the potential effect of arranging purchases as individual units, parens, single cigarettes, single pods, no more parens, versus more re realistic arrangements, back into parens, whole packs, four packs, and jewel pods, et cetera. Yeah, so um, this comes down to a measurement uh, challenge, right? So if somebody, um, the bigger the units, the less chances you have uh, for looking at sensitivity to price, right? What's the difference, you know, if you're a one pack a day smoker and you wanna um, look at the effects of price, uh, where does it go from one pack a day to? Um, you have a limited um, a li limited um, range of potential values that you can measure. So that's why we, we do do that. Um, the way to get around that is to have purchasing for much longer durations of time. So uh, if you're a pack a day, I'm gonna, you can purchase two, two weeks worth, right? Or a week's worth. Um, and then you have a little more uh, uh, nuance in, in your, the, the, the way that you can break up purchasing. Uh, but if, you know, so with our studies, we've been interested mostly in being able to show sensitivity to price and in a very graded fashion. And uh, you need to have more units being purchased to accomplish that. Now you can do that by either decreasing the frequency, the, the size of the unit or increasing the duration of the time with larger units increasing duration of time with larger units um, would be the way that I would think about that. Um, I think it's interesting. And another interesting aspect of this is, you know, even though we're looking at purchasing of uh, individual cigarettes and we're increasing the price, or in uh, the old behavioral economics laboratory at University of Vermont where people were purchasing individual puffs on a cigarette, uh, we found confirmation generally with what you would expect from uh, the tax literature uh, done with, you know, uh, nationally, right, or at, at different state levels. Um, so it, it, although it may be more face valid to have bigger units, whether it's more empirically valid is, a, 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 of course, an empirical question. Warren, I'll raise a question that was going through my mind and I'm sure you have pondered it, but um, there's so much that can be usefully um, investigated with this, this model. And um, the one on punishment for um, activity in the illicit market, it, it reminded me that there was that whole body of work by Azrin about <laughs> effective punishment, ineffective punishment. And you could look at the extent to some, you know, to, to the extent 
that would apply here. For example, you know, smart starting small with fines and then gradually escalating is not an effective way to discourage going to the to the um, illicit market. And um, you know, just other parameters that I am sure policymakers in the area of tobacco regulation are contemplating this illicit illicit market and what kinds of rules they need to have in place and what kinds of enforcement um so any thoughts yeah well i think i think well i think you're right um it would be um for anybody who's um behaviorally analytic aware right um probably nate's work could be very informative as they think about these um um methods right and uh, we're we are um participating in a renewal of a PO1 that um, we just found out is going to be funded with the ITC group down at uh, Medical University of South Carolina and, and other places. And we're going to be exploring um, different types of different types of quote unquote punishments in our illegal tobacco marketplace. And um, I'm certainly going to be very sensitive to uh, some of those variables that you mentioned, Steve. And think through how we could, um, you know, find things that are, are effective, both in the short term and in, in the longer term, uh, particularly when, you know, whenever everyone may, probably remembers, what is it like two years ago or three years ago, we had all these long related um, health challenges from people smoking, um, you know, homemade or, it, or, or not commercially available e-liquids. Well, that's that's the risk of the uh, part of the risk of the illegal marketplace, yeah. and having people um, trying to get people to avoid that risk is a, certainly a worthwhile goal. That um, the punishment model um, could affect. It's going to be interesting, right? Because ideally, we wouldn't want to use punishment at all. Wish we could just get people to not smoke or switch to other products. But even with the trials on the, on the very low nicotine candy cigarette, there seemed like there was a lot of purchasing of conventional cigarettes and some portion of those individuals it probably, if you couldn't purchase them, would be looking for other sources. Yeah. Well, the utility of unit price, I think is going to factor in. What's, yeah. what's the price of going over to that illegal market, you know, factoring in potential punishment and how frequently you're apprehended and uh, prosecuted. And, yeah. I, and I also would think your narrative research is relevant. Um, you know, how often are there uh, toxins in the products that are purchased illegally and that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. And the well, one thing we haven't brought into that yet, but I, I you know, I, I will sooner or later is um, so the fact that I don't, you know, so once again, we're in the middle of an opioid uh, overdose crisis, right? It's continuing and getting worse, uh, very challenging. Um, not a single, I'm willing to bet that not a single person who ends up in the ER didn't know empirically, right? Have knowledge that by using the substance, they were taking a risk in their life, but they had uh, such a short-term focus, i.e. measured by delay discounting, that those consequences had no value. Right, those were downstream. Um, and one thing that would be interesting to explore as we look at these consequences for illicit purchasing is how does temporal view and the delay to receipt of the um, noxious outcome um, result in their discounting? Yeah, absolutely. I see the two um, additional questions that have come in were, we have time to handle those and maybe we'll wrap up with those, Warren. Um, right. So the first is again from Caitlin and, oh, she, she was thanking you for your answer uh, <laughs> to the, her last question, so that's terrific. Next sure. from Eric Threlkill, um, and his question is, do factors such as delayed discounting influence if, when, or whether, um, and it just got knocked around here on this, somehow, <laughs> Or there it is on the top. Uh, do factors such as delayed discounting influence if, when, or whether individuals substitute in the ETM? So you were just starting to go there a little bit, I think. Yeah. So one of the um, 
so yeah so i'll jump into the the the, the thought about delay and and uh, substitution right so we know that um substitutes result in um greater elasticity of demand right so if if um, i can get basically the same thing someplace else cheaper right i'm not going to buy the expensive one right um so that's a general model right but there's another form of substitution that's intertemporal. I'm not going to buy it today because I know I can get it at the other place cheaper tomorrow. Um, but intertemporal substitution brings into the concept of time and how much you're discounting it. And the longer the delay to between those markets, the greater um, I, my, I would predict, particularly it's probably dependent on the person's discount rate, right? But um, the further away in time it is, the less, uh, the, the less degree of substitution. The less degree of substitution, the less sensitivity to price for the original commodity, right? There's a reason why convenience stores who are open at three o'clock in the morning can charge a very high price because uh, there are limited substitutes, right? Uh, you have to wait if you wanna uh, get something cheaper at the grocery store um, in principle. So delay, um, so I would predict delay resent, results in less sensitivity to price. Um, and that, that's something that could be manipulated in the context of uh, ETM would be long sessions though. Purchase now or for purchase for later, we'll, we'll, you can come back at, at 6 p.m. or the next day or next week to get your purchase. Um, and see how sensitive people are to increasing price when that's the only substitute, right? I think that's a pretty interesting and I think in part reflects the challenges with people um, who discount a lot and who have suffered from different addictive disorders is because they're generally not good at waiting. So that means they'll do anything to get it now if I can say that in an extreme, extreme non-nuanced way, right? Um, and less concerned about the price for now because for all intents and purposes, there doesn't appear to be to them a, a later option. Well, great, Warren. Thank you so much for a really informative and fascinating lecture. Um, so yeah, it's, it was just terrific. And then I want to thank the audience for, for being with us and remind you that in October, um, we don't have a single speaker. We instead have a two-day conference that we'll be streaming um, on uh, innovations in the area of um, research on reducing cigarette smoking. Uh, that is October 7th and 8th. And um, Neil Benowitz is our keynote speaker, but our entire panel um, across the two days is, are, is uh, comprised of excellent speakers. So I encourage you to uh, join us for that. And um, with that, I think we can wrap up. Uh, so again, Warren, thanks. To Thank you. you very much for the opportunity to share this work. Yeah, great. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, Warren, outstanding, man. I'm gonna I'm gonna come to the uh, lecture with the or the meeting with the uh, students for at least for a short while. Sure. So yeah, yeah. Look forward to talking to you there, and 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 this was uh, just terrific. Great, thank you. All right, yeah. take care. All right.